All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Greenwood. I'm the president and CEO of Bio. I want to thank you for coming to this session. We um, historically leave the creme de la creme to the end of the convention, so you will uh, stay here, and I refer to my guests, not to myself on that. Um, but thank you for coming uh, to the convention. It, this has been uh, one of our most successful uh, conferences. Uh, we've had 1,350 people on site in the last uh, 48 hours, which is up 15% from last year. We have 762 investors on site, which is up 28% from last year. Uh, 1,387 one-on-ones uh, scheduled, uh, and that's up 7% from last year. So I hope it has been a good conference for all of you. And I'm going to embarrass Celia Economides and ask her to stand up. Um, but Celia is the one who manages all of this and makes it happen. So um, we, have, we are very fortunate this evening to have two um, great Washington insiders who have been about as close to the inner circle as you can get. They have been uh, chiefs of staff to presidents of the United States in recent history. And I'm going to actually read a couple of introductions and then we'll go into some questions and answers. But to my far left and only uh, figuratively speaking, or literally speaking, I should say, is managing director uh, is Joshua Bolton. He is the managing director of Rock Creek Global Advisors, which he co-founded in 2011. Mr. Bolton served in the White House under President George W. Bush as Chief of Staff from 2006 to 2009. Previous to that, he was the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy from 2001 to 2003 and Director of the Office of Management and Budget from 2003 to 2006. During his nearly 20 years of government service, he also served as General Counsel to the U.S. Trade Representative, Chief Trade Counsel to the U.S. Senate Finance Committee, and as an attorney at the U.S. State Department. After leaving the White House, he spent two years as a visiting professor at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. His, just so you think he wasn't constantly on the government dole, he had previous private sector experience, including uh, work as executive director for legal and government affairs for Goldman Sachs in London, and as an attorney at Old Melvaney and Myers in Washington, D.C. He is a native of Washington, he received his undergraduate degree from Princeton and his law degree from Stanford. In the nonprofit sector, he serves on the boards of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund, and the One Campaign Against Extreme Poverty and Preventable Diseases, which, where he also served briefly as interim CEO. Sitting to my immediate left is John Podesta. He's a former White House Chief of Staff and founder and co-chair of the Center for American Progress. Under his leadership, American Progress has become a notable leader in the development of an advocacy for progressive policy. Prior to founding the center in 2003, Mr. Podesta served as White House Chief of Staff to President William J. Clinton. He served in the President's Cabinet and as a principal on the National Security Council. While in the White House, he also served as both an assistant to the President and Deputy Chief of Staff as well as Staff Secretary. Mr. Podesta served as co-chair of President Obama's transition. And additionally, he's held numerous positions on Capitol Hill, including Counselor to Democratic Senator Tom Daschle from 1995 to 96. He's currently serving on the UN Secretary General's high-level panel, panel of eminent persons on the post-2015 development agenda. We should find out what the hell that is. <laughs> he is a Chicago native and a graduate of Knox College and the Georgetown University Law Center, where he is currently a visiting professor of law. He's the author of, the, of a book entitled The Power of Progress, How America's Progressives Can, Once Again, Save Our American Economy, Our Climate, and Our Country. So thank you both for being with us. Um, let's start with the, probably the question that is on everyone's mind when we think about Washington, D.C. Today is February 12th, and I believe it's March 1st that sequestration kicks in and $85 billion across the board is cut from both the defense and the non-entitlement uh, spending. Uh, is it going to happen? <laughs> I, well, I'll, 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 I'll take the first I shot, think, and I think yeah, we I think, John I think should, we sort of, I think, I I think, think John should probably. go first because he is a UN eminent person. <laughs> That's right, he is a UN eminent person. We're, try we're just trying to figure out how to end extreme poverty in the world. There you go. Uh, anyways, uh, the sequester. 
uh, I think we're going to probably agree on this, which is we're now in a circumstance where the, uh, the president has suggested a delay of the sequester to give time to, to both move forward on uh, tax reform and social insurance reform, try to put a bigger uh, a budget de deal together, so kick the can down the road one more time. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the uh, Senate is going to take up a bill later this week, which provides a temporary extension. Uh, Democrats will probably all vote for that. Republicans will probably all vote against that. I don't see anything coming together on the and House side. And the Republicans side. will vote against it because it will include new it's revenue. It's 50-50. It'll be a 50-50 bill. It'll be 50 50 uh, uh, percent of the money to, to, to move that sequester back by eight months will, will come from uh, revenue, 50 percent from cuts. And, uh, and is the new revenue new taxes, or is it, do you have a sense of where they're going to find the revenue? Uh, it, it, they haven't gone to the personal income tax side for the most part. Uh, they're trying to find revenue that uh, at least has been voted on before things that they that mm -hmm. people would legitimately I think view as closing tax loopholes and and trying to uh, uh, that, that uh, I, I correct myself in one regard uh, it, it, it includes the so-called Buffett rule uh, so that takes another bite out of uh, high income taxpayers uh, on the personal income tax side but mostly it's things that that have been voted on or debated before but I think it's largely uh, being done in a context where no one thinks that this is likely to put significant pressure on the on the House uh, to move something forward. The House doesn't seem to uh, be particularly anxious to uh, move anything forward. So I think we're likely to see the beginnings of the sequester take place at the beginning of March. Uh, when that begins to bite, not just in defense where, it, where the cuts are really loaded up, but where it bites against uh, uh, all elements of core government, I think that will push people back to the table. And sometime later in the spring, I think people will return to try to restructure a deal with the White House uh, to avoid the worst of that sequester. Uh, whether that happens later in the month or later in the summer, I'm not certain. But I think at, for at least some time, we're going to see those, those cuts begin to be implemented. Any significant differences? No, no significant differences. I, I agree with John that that's the way it's going to play out. Um, it just, it, going back in time a little bit, where did, where did the sequester come from? It, there was, Hell. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a crappy idea whose time apparently has come. And it's, it came from the deal that was reached in 2011 to, uh, to permit the, uh, the Congress to vote for an increase in the debt ceiling. We were bumping up against the debt ceiling. Republicans were insisting on spending cuts to vote for an increase in the debt ceiling. At that time, they, they found a good hostage and, uh, and, and tried to make it work for themselves. Um, and so they, they arrived at uh, uh, what the speaker required was uh, for every dollar increase, Mr. President, that you want in the debt ceiling, we're going to insist that over 10 years there be a commensurate cut in spending. So they, the president said, OK, I, want, uh, I need over $2 trillion in increase in the debt ceiling because the president's primary objective was to get the next debt ceiling crisis past the 2012 election, which he did. He said, I need two point, uh, over $2 trillion in, uh, in debt ceiling increase. And the speaker said, OK, then we're going to have to cut spending by over $2 trillion. And they arrived at a formula that involved about a $1 trillion in caps on discretionary spending. And they said they appointed a super committee to deal with the balance of $1.2 trillion. And in order to try to force the super committee to reach a deal, they said, OK, uh, if the super committee doesn't reach a deal on how to take out the next $1.2 trillion in a sensible way, we're going to do it in this incredibly stupid way of across-the-board cuts in, uh, in most government programs, except for the ones that most need to be cut, that is Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. So that's how we got to the sequester. That's where we are. I agree with John that uh, 
The parties are very unlikely, uh, certainly between now and March 1st, but I would say even for some time beyond that to be able to reach an accommodation because it appears that Democrats will insist that any replacement for the sequester involve tax increases as well as spending cuts. No Republican will vote for tax increases at this point, having succumbed to the tax increases that averted the, the fiscal cliff on January 1st. Um, so that is, the, that is the, where we will find ourselves in tension. Jim, a little bit of a disagreement with, with John. Uh, who, uh, John, you sound a little bit optimistic that maybe they will, the pressure will be intense enough from the sequester cuts to bring Republicans and Democrats together fairly promptly after the sequester bites on March 1st. I'd be skeptical about that, um, and I think we may be, we may sort of just bump along until the next crisis, which will be the next expiration of the debt ceiling, which will occur sometime in the June-July timeframe. Although intervening is the you know, continuing resolution, for those of you who don't Washington speak, uh, when the Congress can't and the President can't agree on a new budget, a new set of appropriations bill, they say, well, in that case, let's just fund everything the way we have been in the last year. That's called a continuing resolution or a CR. And that now, after it had been pushed forward again in New Year's Day, uh, expires on March 27th. And so if Congress does nothing again, uh, then the government shuts down. On, on March 27th, and I think Republicans have decided that um, they got rolled or beat on, uh, on taxes on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve, and that they had New Year's Day, I guess it was, and that they did allow the taxes to go up. Uh, they're not going to get rolled again. They, they decided that the, the debt ceiling was not a good hostage to take because they were, it would be accused of, of sh shaking the whole world economy. Um, and so they're using sequestration as the least painful. Government shutdown is also a tough thing to swallow politically. Uh, so, so, but let us assume that, the, which I think is a safe assumption, assumption that sequestration happens March 1st, and let us assume that in the next less than four weeks they're going to try to put something together to avoid the CR. And they don't have to. They could just agree to continue the CR some more. Um, right. But at some point, let's just agree that they have to do something because 10 years of sequestration is unacceptable. And the, and the screaming from all quarters, defense and elsewhere, would be so intense that they have to do something. Now, you have Republicans saying, we will not raise taxes again, like in blood. Um, and you have Democrats saying, we will not um, do structural reform of Medicare, at least a la Ryan's premium support plan. So the question is, giving this sort of immovable force and, and immovable, immovable object and irresistible force, where could a possible deal be made? Well, listening to the three of us, I think I, I should say, we should have begun by saying we're from Washington, we're here to depress you. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think the president has, uh, I, this doesn't probably reflect the thinking of the Democrats on Capitol Hill, but I think if you look at where Obama's been, I think he's open to uh, a, a, a deal that would raise uh, some additional revenue, uh, presumably through tax reform, uh, to broaden the base, but also raise some additional revenue, combined with uh, structural reform of the social insurance programs. Uh, he was willing to stick his neck out on, uh, on Social Security on the adjustment to the COLA formula. That was very much resisted by Democrats on Capitol Hill. But he's basically backed that up by saying it's still on the table. Uh, so I think he's open to uh, a conversation and a deal. How much of that he puts out tonight, I think, is a big question. You know, does he embrace that or does he basically say, this is my vision for the way the economy ought to run? Uh, you know, we know a bunch of things that he's going to say. He's going to double down on trying to revitalize manufacturing in the U.S. He's going to talk about innovation. He's going to talk about education. He's going to talk about investments in infrastructure. He's going to say he's not going to add to the deficit. But is he going to open up the conversation on this, this set of questions a trade, more revenue for entitlement reform. I, I don't know the answer to that It would question. certainly be ironic if he did, 
And you saw the Republicans standing and cheering while the Democrats. Well, the Democrats sat. don't want him to do that. I think that that you know that's you know fairly safe to say. But the president's been, like I said, he's stuck his neck out further than I think mm -hmm. where the congressional Democrats, uh, at least at this moment, want to go. I think if he went there, uh, they would actually follow him because I think they trust his leadership uh, on this set of questions, and they would follow him. Um, I, think, I think tonight is a, is a great time to get a sense of how this is going to play out, because if the president does what John described, um, then I think uh, I would become optimistic that a, some accommodation could be reached soon and successfully. If, on the other hand, uh, which I think uh, sadly is more likely, he's likely to use the occasion to simply increase the pressure on Republicans for being responsible for a slow economy and cuts that nobody wants to have happen, um, and that's where it ends, um, uh, then I think we're in for a very bumpy spring and summer um, because I don't, uh, it's hard to see where the accommodation is going to come from. So well, that, that, watch, that's, watch a, the State of the Union tonight. That's a critical point because if John is right, and the president, for purposes of his legacy and for purposes of his caring about the country, decides he's going to go farther towards the Republicans than many of the leaders, leaders in the rank and file in the, in the House and Senate Democratic parties are willing to go. Um, then he's going to have to do something which he really heretofore has not been able to accomplish. If you look at both of you experienced working for presidents when the other party was running the Congress, and both presidents managed to make deals with the other party. So you think of, of, uh, uh, of welfare reform uh, under President Clinton. We think of No Child Left Behind under President Bush working with Kennedy. Um, so far, uh, in his first term, you can't really, I don't think, point to a place where you say President Obama went and made a deal that stuck um, with the Republicans. Um, and it would take that. It would, t it would take that action to his part. And I think you're right, John, that, that if the president did that, the Democrats would feel, A, they owe it to this president to follow his lead, and B, they have some cover, because it's the president's initiative, not theirs. Um, is that likely to happen? Do you think that the president will make, can make a deal, is willing to make a deal with, the, with Republicans? Um, I, I hope so. John will know better than I whether, whether he's likely to. I think he's unlikely to because it, it just doesn't seem to be in his makeup. Um, but yeah, in the, in the Bush administration, we did um, the No Child Left Behind Education Act with Senator Kennedy. Uh, President Bush and Senators Kennedy and McCain reached a, an accommodation on a comprehensive immigration reform bill that failed very narrowly in the, uh, in the Senate at the end of the day by just, uh, just a few votes toward a position that we're, we're going to try to crawl our way back toward over the next many months. I don't know how successfully. Uh, the Medicare uh, prescription drug provision was passed on a bipartisan basis. Even the original, the first Bush tax cut was a, was a bipartisan deal. So there were uh, as contentious and partisan as the years in which I served in the White House were, there were opportunities that President Bush seized to reach an accommodation. Um, but it, it required something that right now doesn't appear to be in President Obama's makeup, which is do you have to be prepared to leave behind a significant core of your own party and make some substantive accommodations. and. Uh, you know, uh, for better or worse, that, that hasn't been what President Obama has done. The partisan environment is worse today even than it was during the Bush or Clinton years. Um, but there's a great opportunity to do that. And if, if the president would listen to John Podesta and, and pursue the kind of departure uh, that, that John suggested just now, if he, if he does that tonight, I, th I think that's a watershed moment and a, and a great opportunity for the president to make a legacy. So all this rests well, on your shoulders. Well, no, I mean, I think there's, look, I, th I, th I think the, uh, the one chapter of the book that, that Josh left out is what's going on in the House Republican Caucus, too. Hmm. And, you know, uh, I think 
President Clinton and President Bush were able to uh, forge those agreements because there were leadership on the other side who you could forge the agreements with. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, that was also uh, part of the equation. And, you know, I, both, I work with both uh, Speaker Gingrich and with Speaker Hastert. Speaker Gingrich, we were never quite sure where, where that conversation was going. But, with, you know, if, if Hastert said he'd do something, he'd deliver his caucus and he'd do it. And I think uh, now you've got the circumstance that it's, I think it's very hard to negotiate with this, with this House caucus because the leadership in the House caucus doesn't really control the caucus. And uh, so you've... Uh, you've got that, that kind of bubbling Tea Party crowd underneath that makes things really, really tough. I think that uh, the most likely place where agreement will be forged in the near term is going to be on immigration, actually. I'm very optimistic that uh, partly because of the politics and the results of the last election, uh, partly because of some uh, Republican leadership in the Senate, I think we're, we're moving forward uh, to having uh, real comprehensive, comprehensive immigration mm -hmm. reform. And, and, I, and I know the President will put a lot of capital into trying to make that happen. Uh, his other big priorities, you know, uh, particularly uh, on the budget, I think are ones that I think, you know, maybe he, the lesson he learned from December is kind of the opposite, which is if I keep that pressure up, that's the only way I could create the kind of circumstances where I can give something, they can give something, and we can, and we can, and we can strike a deal. Uh, the other place where I think the president is likely to be more active in this, this, this will, since I'm dredging this up from where it hasn't been talked about, but I think where there could be the potential for some more bipartisan agreement, so I think he's got a bigger trade agenda, this Congress. Then he it, well, it has to be bigger than it was last Congress. Uh, <laughs> but I think that they really are serious about finishing the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and they're very serious about opening up a USEU uh, free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. And I think those are places where uh, you can pot potentially bridge the partisan divide. It would be good for the country. Uh, it would you know, increase, I think, uh, the competitiveness of the economy. So I think there are places, uh, whether, whether Ultimately, uh, it's going to be around fundamental tax reform, which I, again I, I think would be good for the uh, for the competitiveness competitiveness of the economy. There's an awful big distance between the views of of the parties on that. It's pretty hard to close, but we'll see. You mentioned uh, President Clinton worked with Speaker Gingrich. I I can recall um, one time when I was in Congress when Gingrich marched down to the White House to cut some hard deals over. The budget and and, uh, and trying to prevent a, a government shutdown and and uh, no more spending. We're going to have these cuts. We're going to balance the budget. And he came back to Republic to our caucus and he said, "That guy is a charmer." He said, "I went in there pounding on the table and next thing I know, my eyes are going like this and I'm <laughs> handing him my wallet." And, uh, so you got to be careful. You mentioned that uh, tonight is the State of the Union. As as you all know, when you w watch. Uh, uh, the State of the Union. It's uh, it's a highly ceremonial uh, ceremonial event, and in marches the well. The the House is there from the beginning. In fact, there are some members of the House who are already sitting there right now because they want those aisle seats, and so they get in early. You can't reserve seats. I, I took the six o'clock shuttle. I saw Elliot Engel taking the yeah. seven o'clock <laughs> shuttle down to get one of those. Elliot seats. Engel. <laughs> We'll vote against, he would vote against President Bush all day long, but boy, did he want to be sitting there. He could be seen on camera shaking his hand. But uh, the, the House... For those New Yorkers, it. watch it tonight. House, that's right. Yeah, Bush yeah. loved that, by the way. Right. Um, House uh, files in, the Senate files in, um, the, the, the Cabinet files in, the Justice of the Supreme Court, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the... the um, Diplomatic Corps, yeah. everybody who's everybody in the, in the government is there. But um, because of that, uh, some time ago, Congress realized that that was a heck of a target for Al Qaeda or somebody else. And so it might be a little messy if, it's probably a debatable point, but if all of those people were destroyed at one point, um, <laughs> what, what, what would the, how would the government succeed? What would be the succession? How, so, so there's a, a law that says that the one cabinet member must not be on the floor and must be um, 
remain someplace safe so that in court, if all hell breaks loose, uh, somebody would take over the reins of government. And I think John has a, an interesting story about, because the chief of staff of the president decides which cabinet member that is. Tell that story. And, and, you, have to tell, and you have to call him up and tell him. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad part of the job. <laughs> Uh, well, one year, I, uh, Secretary Glickman was serving as our agriculture secretary, and uh, he drew the short straw, as it were. Uh, so I had to call him up and tell him that he had to leave town. Uh, but, but he and his wife, uh, are, they love uh, culture, and they, he was the head of the Motion Picture Association for a while after, subsequent to his being agriculture secretary. And he, they love New York, and they love uh, going to the theater. So. His, this is pre-9-11. Uh, he decided he was, you know, we, we talked about it, and he and his wife came up here. But because he had to be able, in the, in the event of a tragedy, to be able to, to uh, serve as uh, then President of the United States, he was accompanied what, by something that he wasn't used to, which was a full Secret Service detail. And he went and, to the theater, right? And he goes, to the, the, he goes with the detail to the theater. And they... Josh knows this, but there are a couple of people who will be sitting with him. The rest are dispersed in the, in the, in the theater. President Clinton gives the State of the Union address while this play is going on. And Clinton's they, feeling pretty damn he's, important he's, right now. He's sitting there with, with uh, feeling like the almost president of the United States. <laughs> and uh, the, the play ends. They get up. Clinton's done. He's gone back to the White House. They walk him out of the theater and disperse, leaving him on the corner to hail a cab because he is no longer the first in line to be the president of the United States. So famous fleeting in this business of politics. So, so uh, chiefs of staff uh, spend a lot of their time giving advice to the president. And the president spends a lot of time getting advice from a whole series of folks who come and go. And they're not all in the room at, the one, at one time. And I always think it's interesting that it is ultimately only the president who gets the 360 degree span because he's been out there with the constituents in the campaign. He's hearing from various experts and advisors. He's hearing from various members of his campaign. He's hearing from the chief of staff. And then at that lonely moment when he's sitting in the Oval Office and the buck stops there, he's, he has to make a decision all by himself at the end of the day. Can you think of a time when uh, either President Clinton or President Bush uh, that you can recall sort of weathered all that and made a, a momentous decision that might have been contrary to a lot of the advice he was getting and, um, and things went well or not so well as a result of that decision? Um, there, there were a lot of moments like that, I mean, in the Bush presidency. <laughs> Uh, which, which had a lot of consequential moments in it. I mean, um, among the most dramatic was uh, during the financial crisis in September of 2008 when the president on very little notice had to make a decision whether to authorize his secretary of the treasury and team to go up and ask for <clears throat> what, what was originally gonna be a trillion dollars but everybody thought that sounded like too much so we said, okay, 700 billion sounds sort of more manageable, and ask for 700 billion dollars to bail out Wall Street, of all things. Um, the absolute last thing that, uh, that President Bush would have wanted to do. Um, but th that decision, I think, was, uh, it was momentous, and it was very painful for President Bush, but it wasn't that difficult a decision because his, his advisors were united and the, the situation didn't actually leave that, that many alternatives. I mean, I guess, I guess an alternative would have been to dither, um, but that was not President Bush's style at all. And he had his Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, his Federal Reserve Chairman, Ben Bernanke, and the President of the New York Fed, Tim Geithner, who were the, basically the trio on whom the president relied for advice throughout the crisis. He had the three of them in the Roosevelt room sitting across from him saying, if we don't do this, and if we don't do this in the next few days, we're looking at the next Great Depression. And the president said, okay, pretty, 
pretty easy, let's do it. And then he went around comforting everybody, saying it's gonna be all right. Uh, when we got back into the Oval Office, um, I, walked, I walked back into the Oval Office with him and he said, uh, you know, that's a, that's a horrible decision for me to have to make, but I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, if, if, it, if the next event is the Great Depression, for damn sure I'm gonna be Roosevelt and not Hoover. And, uh, and that's where he left it and he was comfortable with that. The decision he really struggled with, and that, and that was against the, uh, the weight of advice that he was getting from his senior advisors, was whether to double down in Iraq when the war was going extremely badly in 2006. Uh, and we were, we were headed for what I think what would have resembled a Vietnam-like defeat. And the advice that the president was getting from the foreign policy intelligentsia, including in, in, the, uh, in the form of a high-level commission, um, the advice that the president was getting even from his joint chiefs of staff were, let's try to trim our losses, let's try to get out gracefully, leave as stable a situation behind as we can, um, but this is unwinnable, let's get out. And, but there were a few voices, including that of General David Petraeus, uh, the commander on the ground, saying, um, uh, we, if we change our strategy, if we, if we actually put our priority on protecting the civilians in Iraq, um, then we have a reasonable shot at actually stabilizing the situation and, and basically winning this conflict, winning defined as not, uh, not leaving a disaster behind. But it requires that we basically double down on our troop commitment. And that was a really tough choice that the president made only over a period of weeks. Uh, he made it in a, you know, with support from some advisors, but again, with the overwhelming weight of advice being against it, I, I think that must have been um, uh, the loneliest and most difficult decision of his presidency, and uh, it turned out to be the right one. A lot of those guys were going to die. And men, yeah. Women. Look, I, I, you know, this is... Uh, particularly post 9-11, uh, Josh experienced in this more than I did. But the weightiest decisions the president makes are ones uh, to commit force, to, uh, uh, to engage in armed conflict, and to know in a way that I think only the president himself uh, really knows that you're in the process, you're going to kill a lot of innocent people too. Uh, and you know we experienced that in uh, uh, in when I was chief of staff, there were you know uh, uh, Clinton was engaged in a, a variety of of, uh, of different uh, actions. But when I was chief of staff, we we were engaged in the reversing the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, and everybody kind of moved easily into that decision to begin the air campaign in Kosovo, but it started off going very badly. The, the ethnic cleansing continued. They pushed a million people out of Kosovo. Uh, Milosevic did. The, uh, they were on a rampage there, really. The, the air campaign wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, succeeding. And uh, <laughs> much like uh, Josh's story, Wes Clark was the one guy who said, we can do this, we can make this work. But, a lot of his other senior advisors, including his most senior national security advisors, I, we were sitting in, in the Oval Office, and you could see the nervousness of that. And uh, Clinton basically, at one point, as he was wont to do, put his, reached over and put his hand on the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and said, I made this decision. It was the right call. Just go back, execute the decision. This is, we're going to do the right thing. And it kind of brought the team together, and then uh, fortunately, we moved along. We almost committed ground troops there, but uh, Milosevic, you know, eventually uh, uh, blinked, and we were able to, and we were able to be successful there. But I think that those moments where you know that you're you're putting young American men and women at risk, and where you're whatever's likely to happen, as I said, a lot of innocent people are likely to be killed in the process. Those are very, very tough calls for the president. And uh, 
Um, we, had some, we had some sort of happier moments that, that seemed like hard calls at the time. I don't know if you remember this, Jim, but, but uh, when we developed, uh, we, we eventually uh, were working off a of surplus. Um, my my, my uh, great achievement was, was to be lucky enough just to be sitting there when we had three surpluses in a row. Uh, and uh, Clinton, in his State of the Union address, uh, said we are not going to spend the surplus until we save Social Security. And he kind of put that line in the sand. And the Republicans developed a bill to cut taxes because this, this big surplus was beginning to accumulate. Uh, Alan Greenspan was worried that we were going to pay off our national debt and that would, we wouldn't be able to price the 10-year bond uh, if we did that. It seems like a long time ago. It'd be a horrible um, problem to have. Wouldn't it? <laughs> and, and, uh, and John's John's right. There were and we, we had this at the beginning of the Bush administration was deep concern from the Treasury that we were paying off the debt too quickly. <laughs> and the uh, uh, anyways, the 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 Republicans who control both houses developed a bill. Some bunch of Democrats voted for it that would cut taxes, and we were pretty sure we could hold a veto. Uh, but people were nervous about it because the surplus was, get, was, was, was pretty large. I think it was about $300 billion that year. And uh, uh, Clinton basically said, you know, we made this decision. We're, gonna, we're not going to let them cut tax until, until we do something about Social Security. So let's embrace it with gusto. And I think it was the first time we did a veto ceremony in the Rose Garden <laughs> with a Marine Corps band playing in the background. <laughs> so uh, normally you reserve that for it. bill signings, not for vetoes, but we had some good times there too. So let me, let me uh, ask the audience, how many people know who Dennis McDonough who is? McDonough. McDonough, Dennis McDonough. Greg Simon, raise your hand. Right. <laughs> anyway, he is President Obama's brand new chief of staff. Uh, so what advice would you give to him? Well, you go first, because I've given him some advice. <laughs> so have I. Has he called you yet? <laughs> <laughs> he, you know what? He has, and, uh, and, I, and I give him a lot of credit for that. He's, and, um, that uh, in a sense, that's the advice I would, he already took the advice that I, would, uh, that I was going to give him, which is um, it's, a, it's a bitterly partisan environment. Um, and the substantive disagreements should not be underestimated. I mean, there's a lot of attention now being put on the incivility and partisanship that is making, making agreement uh, impossible in Washington. All of that is true, but we're all, we also happen to be at a period in our history when there are major disagreements between the parties on, uh, on the direction of our country and our priorities and uh, in particular how our how our fiscal um, uh, and if you want to see real lack of civility in the Congress go see Lincoln right mm -hmm. oh yeah no I mean there's been much much worse times uh, President Bush always used to like to pull out uh, what was said about Lincoln in the in the in the Congress and in, in the newspapers and uh, whenever somebody would come in sort of you know you know when the New York Times said blah blah and they kind of, and, and Bush always, he, he never read the New York Times, I can say, but, um, but he'd, always, he'd always brush it off and refer back to, said, you know, we've, we've always had this, uh, this problem with incivility. Um, but Dennis McDonough can do, uh, can do a lot just with the kind of tone that he, um, mm. that he sets in the White House um, and that he sets in the White House's relations with the Hill over which the, which the chief of staff can have a um, can have a pretty substantial influence. Well, uh, he and I are old friends. We worked together for, for Senator Daschle, and he worked at Center for American Progress. So we're, we're colleagues and, and close. And, uh, and we have, in some ways, I think, we're similar. Uh, Josh had been a cabinet secretary before he came back as chief of staff. But we have a similar background in that we rose from staff rank up to being the chief of staff and being basically a principal in, in, the, in the president's team. And uh, I gave him, I, sa I said two things to him. One, uh, something that Erskine Bowles, who was my predecessor and who I served as deputy to, told me, which is you have to stop talking and listen. Very good advice for a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
you, you think you know a lot, but if you're talking, you're not listening. <laughs> and uh, I tried to follow that, and I think it's important because I think this White House has to open up more. Um, I think it's been, in some ways, uh, too much of a closed shop, and I think he has an opportunity to kind of reset mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and open, you know, him both open, you know, I used to think the bars were up to keep people from the outside from getting in. When I worked there, I realized it was the bars were actually there for, to keep us from getting out. <laughs> you know, you have, to make, you have to make a pretty concerted effort to reach out, to open up, to listen to different mm -hmm. views, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And the second is sort of a corollary of that. I don't think that the, I think the, the if I have one uh, uh, criticism of the Obama administration, I probably have more than one, but I have, if, I, if I could focus on one thing that I think they were too preoccupied with was they made the president the prime minister. They didn't make him the chief executive of the whole enterprise. And I think the president has enormous talents, both as a, uh, as a convener in the nation, as someone who can really go out um, and explain and teach and, and bring people along with them, but most particularly to use all the assets he has, particularly the uh, the talent he has across a very talented cabinet uh, and talented leadership in his government uh, to bring the full force of his ideas to bear. Uh, and I think they were a little bit, got into that mode in the first couple of years. They were dealing with crisis. They were trying to pass these big bills, the Affordable Care Act, deal with the recovery bill, deal with, uh, you know, Dodd-Frank, et cetera. They got too focused on just the White House operation and its relationship to the Hill. I think they forgot about a lot of talent they had in the cabinet. Mm -hmm. And I think if, I think a second term presidency in particular, that there's a lot of execution that really matters. Uh, you've got more experienced people, you've got, uh, you've, you've, you've got ideas that have germinated that now need to be brought home. You know, it, it, particularly in, in, in the world uh, all of you guys are living in, uh, implementing the Affordable Care Act is as big a challenge as passing the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that he needs, you know, he needs the, the kind of full weight of his government behind him in, in doing that. And I'm, I'm confident that they will, uh, that they get that and that they're going to really try to work to make sure that that happens. Let me ask a question that, that really is biotech centric. Um, so we've been talking a lot about the national debt because I think most of us agree that, the, that it is the, the single greatest domestic threat that the nation faces. Uh, it can't go on. Um, we also know that Medicare is the biggest driver of it, and, the, and, and it's a function of the baby boom generation, our generation, if you will. Um, 10,000 baby boomers a day going into Medicare, 20 million of us. Um, the natural impulse of members of Congress and of presidents is to say, okay, well, Medicare pays for hospitals, doctors, drugs, and devices, so we just need to pay less for all that stuff. Just pay the providers less, and we'll bend the curve in that way. And of course, from our point of view, that undermines the quality of the healthcare system significantly, and it potentially can destroy incentive for these investors to invest in our companies um, because they, they're not sure that we're ever going to get, re the companies are going to get reimbursed for the products that they make under that kind of pressure. The other way to look at what we pay for in Medicare is to say we pay for cancer and cardiovascular disease and diabetes and, and, and Alzheimer's, et cetera. And, <coughs> and the best way to reduce the, the cost of, of Medicare is to have fewer people showing up with those very expensive diseases, chronic right. diseases that require hospitalization. Um, and then instead of turning on us, you may turn toward us and say, what do you guys need to be more successful? How would you advise us, not just in terms of talking to the president, but to the body, to the policymakers in Washington, you are going to make that case. If you would advise it, we try to make that case in order to um, avoid what we think would be you know, some disastrous cuts to providers. Well, look, I, you know, I think you're going to continue to be under lots of pressure uh, because I, uh, the, we, you know, we've just begun, I think, the process of reforming the delivery model in the U.S. healthcare system. And I think the you know, front page of the New York Times today has a, has a piece that, that notes that it's now no longer uh, the view of most healthcare economists that this is being driven just by the recession and people's inability to pay, but there's actually a lot going on 
uh, in delivery reform uh, and, in, and in changing the way uh, that we treat people. The truth is that the healthcare system in the U.S. has chronically low productivity improvements. And that's got to change. And I think your industry has a, has a part in changing that and driving uh, different care models that uh, will both, both in the biotech world and also in the infotech world that drives care models towards uh, better results at, at lower costs. And I think that's that, that the, the, the smart players are responding to that. And I think we're seeing uh, both improvement in, in outcome, uh, an attention to uh, particularly uh, in the non-communicable disease space, chronic disease space, to better, better care and better management. That's going to require more experimentation, I think, with, with uh, payment reform so that you're, you're, you're delivering results rather than, uh, you know, a, a kind of the old fee-for-service model. But we're in a period of, of rapid change. My guess is it's not just Medicare. The big, uh, the big payers, the big, the big employers as well, are going to drive in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So I think the whole system is moving towards uh, one that is trying to get better health results but with the kind of productivity gains that we're seeing in other sectors of the economy. And that, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge for your companies, but I think that's where the, that's where the ball game's headed. Mm -hmm. And um, the country needs it because I think that you know, in, at the end of the day, uh, that'll produce not only a healthier workforce, but I think it'll produce a stronger, it's a stronger growth model for the, for the overall country, when you, particularly when you look at uh, the competitive economies that, that uh, ac across the globe and who we need to compete with, we, we, need to, we need to basically get that right. And I think you, the innovation that goes on in this industry is an important story to sell. Um, and, you know, this shouldn't be, I think, uh, 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 you know, that th this is an administration that, at least, that I, think, I think goes beyond embracing the rhetoric. I think the president gets that scientific innovation across a whole range of different topics, energy, uh, medicine, uh, uh, food production, et cetera, are the key to future prosperity in the country. So I think you have to tell your story in that context. John? Um, <clears throat> well, I say this only partly in jest, but, uh, but one of the things you can do is vote Republican. <laughs> Um, and, and I say that only uh, not as a particular partisan, um, and, um, uh, but, I, but I say that because the, um, one, of the, one of the big tensions, I, I, I talked about there, there's some really substantial wide disagreements between the two parties right now. I think both parties, the, at least the sensible portion of both parties, recognize that we are on a completely unsustainable path um, in our fiscal situation because we have made promises in our entitlement programs, especially in Medicare, that we simply cannot afford to keep. We can, we can probably muddle through with the, with the measures that have been taken for the, next, uh, for the rest of this decade. Um, but then the problem beginning in the early 2020s uh, becomes again, once, it once again becomes extremely acute for the, for the reason that Jim said. It's partly demographic, um, but it's also because the debt will compound on itself. Um, and we will find ourselves in a situation where uh, the, the credit markets may easily turn on the United States. Um, and even if they don't, we will be paying a lot more for our debt, which will make our budget situation worse, and you will be paying a lot more for credit, which will, uh, which will deeply suppress the economy. So I think both parties recognize we need to get the entitlement situation under control, at least the sensible parts of both parties recognize that. And one of the biggest tensions is in the Medicare area where you're, if, uh, you're only going to control costs in Medicare, apart from all the improvements in the healthcare system that everybody wants to do. And, and I hope John is right about, um, uh, about how many improvements are embedded in the Affordable Care Act that we're not yet seeing the, the fruits of. I'm skeptical about that, but I hope that's true. But ultimately, we're going to have to make a judgment of are we going to um, start 
uh, increasingly pay providers less and less, or are we going to have to trim back on the benefits that the beneficiaries receive? And so far, Democrats are willing only to push on that first part. You got Republicans who are willing to push on that second part, and I think that's going to ultimately be necessary, that we're, we're just not going to be able to afford the kind of Medicare system that takes upper middle class and wealthy people and pays, for, pays full freight for their health care for what will soon be the last 20 or 25 years of their lives, when it was originally just going to be a few years of their lives. So I, I say it only partly in jest, but I think uh, the country needs to have a serious conversation about trimming back on our promises and entitlements. More immediately, Jim, I think, I think you made, in, just in asking the question, you made a really good case. Um, your members should know that, that bio in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and among both Republicans and Democrats is very highly respected for both the, uh, the substance and the effectiveness of the arguments they make. But you've got, an uphill, you've got an uphill way to go. And the portions of the arguments that you make so well um, that I would emphasize include the one that uh, John just mentioned. Um, but I would also add in the element of international competitiveness because politicians seem to respond very acutely to that. And if, if you can persuade a, a, a policymaker or a politician that if we, don't get the, if, we, if we don't create the right incentives here, these industries are going to go overseas, or others, you know, China's going get, to uh, get a march on us and, and be the high-tech, biotech center of the world rather than the United States, which is rightly where the United States should be, then I think politicians will respond, and I would um, I, would, I would move that near the top of the talking points that you use going forward. I like to describe China Medical City as the Sputnik of our time, because if you see what China's mm -hmm. doing there, it's, uh, it, they intend to compete with us. For, for the healthcare industry, our version of sequestration in the short or in the long term is, is IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, uh, which we loathe. Um, it was part of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and of course, it, uh, it's this unelected group of folks who get to make these, these, these tough decisions uh, about cutting Medicare. Um, we are uh, bent on repealing it, and we have lots of support um, in the Congress to do that, bipartisan support, some of it um, uh, because, frankly, the members didn't like ceding that political power to, to uh, others to begin with. Uh, can you imagine a scenario as 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 proud uh, as uh, as President Obama is of uh, health care reform, where an IPAB repeal could be put in a package that he would be willing to swallow? Um, well, I shouldn't say anything because I think we my think tank originally proposed it. <laughs> so, I, I, okay, I we're going to go to Josh we should, we now. Should put, we, you know, I should be, we, we should get the baseballs, and I should be in the dunking tank. Uh, look, I, you know, did you, I think did you cook was, up the sequester I also? Think, <laughs> yes, we did not propose the sequester. All right. uh, but I think that the the, uh, the having you can call them unelected officials, but the the idea that the congressional process making decisions about about these questions is a superior process is, I think, dubious. Uh, and uh, I think that the, you know, what the, what the structure of this was intended to do was to provide options and analysis uh, for policymakers to move forward rather than to be the policymakers. I think whether uh, Obama would sign a bill repealing it depends on what replaces it. What is the mechanism for teeing up uh, choices about uh, what is likely to be more effective and how do you get, uh, how, how do you embrace good science, good research, and the question, and particularly questions of the, uh, the on effectiveness. So I think that, I, I think if you're just saying, just get rid of it because we really don't have, you know, that's essentially saying we don't have a, we don't have a problem with respect to cost, and we shouldn't look at it. I think that's not going to work. I think you're going to have to come up with something that looks like an alternative that you that that you know feels better from your perspective that you're mm -hmm. going to get 
uh, good results. Any um, comments on that, Josh? No, I agree. We have 26 seconds left. Um, so what is the coolest thing about being the Chief of Staff to the President of the United States? <laughs> and by the way, you can't fool us because we've all seen West Wing, so we know, we know what it's really like. Um. I have to go first. Uh, well, the, I, 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 I'll take that from a different direction, which is that the only thing I miss is flying around on that big airplane. <laughs> that, was, that was definitely, no matter how much you get used to private planes, which I haven't gotten used to, that is an experience all to itself. I think I flew to India with you on that you big plane one time. Yes, I, I missed that as well. Um, it got, you know, in the Bush administration, we never allowed members of Congress on the airplane. It was just sort of, and, that is not I, true. I wrote it many, many times. I know, I know. Uh, we never took any on foreign trips, I think, was the, was the rule. Um, a, a, a lot of cool stuff. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's just a great opportunity to serve. What I, what I usually tell people interested in government service and they're, you know, wondering about this job or that job, if there's... If there's ever an opportunity to work inside the White House gates, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't care if you're cleaning windows and you're only doing it for a week, uh, if there's ever an opportunity to do that, take it, because it is, uh, it is such an enormous privilege. And, and I know John shares my view that um, every day that I got to go through those day, gates, um, I felt, uh, even, even on really bad days, and. You know, trust me, I'm from the Bush administration. We had, <laughs> we had a few. We had a few. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, you had some we, too. We, yeah. yeah, we had a few. Yeah. We had a few yeah. of those. So, uh, so, but uh, I teach at Georgetown uh, in the law school, and I always claim that I set the record for the professor with the most grand jury appearances who was never a prosecutor. So <laughs> we, we, we had a few. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad we didn't have to go through that. Uh, but. Every day was uh, was a uh, was a real privilege, and um, I think um, you know I miss occasionally I miss the airplane, miss Marine One, which is a the helicopter is actually an even cooler way to travel around than a, uh, than an airplane. I occasionally miss the the visits to Camp David, um, but uh, but mainly the. What I miss is the, the camaraderie of colleagues and, and the president, because there's probably no environment like it where you know, a few hundred people are coming together every day uh, with consequential common purpose. And to be, to be in that kind of foxhole, I think, uh, a lot of people in the military experience the same thing, but it's a, but it's a similar experience for uh, the chief of staff or the you know deputy assistant to the assistant to the chief of staff uh, to be to be part of that common purpose and I think it's one of the one of the great parts of the American political system uh, which which permits us to just take a whole new crew every few years and put them into that spot and somehow it works um, and hopefully it will continue for many centuries. A couple, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity at our international convention to interview George W. Bush and Bill Clinton at the same time. And the final question I asked them was, so what do you miss most about the White House? And Bill Clinton said, well, you know, when you're the president of the United States, you can pick your favorite singer, performer, band, and just say, come on down and perform at the White House, and you get your own concert um, with your favorite, favorite performers. And I said to President Bush, well, what do you miss most about the White House? And he said, the desserts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. It's great, it's a great time. Thank you so much.